I am an engineer. Each day I use the information in my brain to make decisions, analyse issues and solve problems. I call it my mental Jenga. Layers of knowledge built up over the years from base level to a point where I can have a useful impact in my field. When it comes to engineering, my foundations were laid here at Cambridge University. This institution prides itself on its teaching methods and I left university proudly touting the first principles methods that were drilled into me. First principles can be defined as the fundamental concepts or assumptions on which a theory, system or method is based. In physics it's sometimes called thinking ab initio and in mathematics they're called axioms. First principles thinking means taking time to understand the fundamentals in your discipline before working up to the problem you're facing. To put it simply, first principles are things that can't be deduced from anything else. The essential facts, irrefutable. As far as I was concerned, when I left university, my mental Jenga was in top-notch condition. Strong foundations from that first principles knowledge and a tall tar from those years spent learning. But then something strange happened, the real world. In 2013, when I left, things in the mental Jenga department weren't quite so rosy. One moment I'd be working on a complex engineering problem and the next, the knowledge escaped me. The Jenga had fallen. What had happened? I jumped off the shoulders of a great university, but then complexity overwhelmed me. It turns out I'm not alone. Each of us has our own tars of Jenga in different parts of life, and we rely on them to stand strong when we come calling. When they don't, it can feel a lot like failure. And to be honest, I was embarrassed. I've spoken to friends who are teachers, doctors, and graduate students who will experience the same feeling in their professional life the sudden onset of knowledge inadequacy. What was causing these collapses? And were first principles a help or a hindrance? Today I want to persuade you that you should embrace these collapses as a golden opportunity. And the real test of success is in how you respond to them. So firstly, why first principles in the first place? To me, the benefits of first principles thinking can be described with one word, innovation. Whether you're approaching a new hobby or solving problems, or trying to create something, first principles can offer a new way of looking at the world. Henry Ford once said, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So by forming your own mental models, you can often form new ideas. Let me offer an example. At the start of the space race, NASA had no option but to create from scratch to get a man on the moon. They had to gather a group of designers, and they had to work it out from themselves. And it was a great success. They were the first ones there. But then the second generation of designers came along. Now there were two options. They could design from first principles, or they could copy and tweak what was done before. Now because of cost considerations, time restraints, and the general reticence to try new technology, they went with the copy and tweak approach. And that worked really well for a number of years. Cut to a couple of decades later, and we have a burgeoning space industry with spiralling costs and massive supply chains. And along comes a man called Elon Musk. He realised that with some clever design, multi-use rockets, and by designing and manufacturing everything in-house, he could drastically reduce the cost of getting something into orbit. And he's doing that today. He's leapfrogged the competition by questioning his fundamental assumptions. Now, when talking about first principles, it can be easy to think that this is just something that you can use in a technical case. But actually, first principles thinking can offer really interesting insights in everyday bits of our life. Say, in the kitchen. Say, baking. <laughs> the usual thing when you go to make a recipe is you open your recipe book, you go down, you follow the recipe, there's very little drama, it's all very reliable, and the results are pretty satisfactory. But you're never going to come up with a new dish if you're following someone else's recipe. I realised this when I was developing my recipes for the Great British Bake Off. If I wanted to come up with something truly new and exciting, I was going to have to learn the fundamentals for myself, baking from scratch. And that's exactly what I did. I taught myself the first principles through trial and error of all the key disciplines, cakes, biscuits, pastry, bread. And I owe a lot of my success in the Great British Bake Off to my application of those first principles. It meant that when I had a meltdown during a technical challenge with something unfamiliar, I was able to rebuild and regroup my Jenga from those strong building blocks. 
and it enabled a lot of success for me. When conventional wisdom said baking shouldn't move, I made rotating pies. <laughs> First principles are great, but we can't use them in every aspect of life. It can take a lot of mental effort to work out something from scratch. It's a trade-off when we learn from first principles. We invest time up front to learn the fundamentals before getting to the problem we're facing. So what's the alternative? Thinking by analogy. Analogy has lots of different names, but it's generally using the conventional wisdom, doing things as they've been done before, uh, following the path that's been trodden. Now, the interesting thing with thinking by analogy is it's great in that it can save you time and it can be efficient. When I'm sat at my desk analysing a jet engine, I don't crunch all the numbers by scratch. I use a computer to run the numbers and the models for me. And that works for two reasons. Firstly, I trust that the assumptions that model is making are correct. And secondly, time and delivery are essential. I need to deliver my work on time and it would simply be impractical to do all that by hand. Another example, if I'm making a meal for my housemates midweek, it's a Wednesday evening, I will more often than not make a recipe I've made tens of times before or pick a quick recipe from a recipe book to do. As much as I love innovating in the kitchen, Wednesday evening with three hungry housemates at the table is not the time for kitchen innovation. <laughs> So first principles is great. It can offer opportunity for innovation and deeper understanding, but it makes sense to use thinking by analogy in a lot of uh, bits of our lives. It's important to realize that both of these methods can lead to a Jenga collapse, as I call it. When thinking by first principles, the tar on the left, you might identify over time that if you don't practice those foundations, you might lose them, they might get eroded. And I find this was what was happening in the engineering example I offered earlier. I haven't learnt the thermodynamics for a number of years, so if they're not caretaked over time, they will erode. But that's a great opportunity. It shows you where there's a gap in your knowledge to strengthen up for next time. When you're thinking by analogy in this right-hand case, if you have a collapse, it can be a bit more serious. It means you might need to question the foundations that you're building on. Is analogy really the right approach? And that can be tricky to do, but again, it's a great opportunity to embrace that new information. The danger comes when we think we've got the tar on the left, whereas we really have the shaky foundations on the right. This is what happens when we think we're using first principles, but really it's grounded on poor assumptions. This can lead to all sorts of problems when it goes unchecked. It can lead to complacency, a lack of creativity when it comes to problem solving, and a mentality I encounter far too often. That's the way it's always been done. It's the equivalent of <coughs> persuading other people to poke out the foundations of their own Jenga. Because when people have these bad assumptions, they're convinced they're right and they want to bring you with them. I realised this when it came to a friend coming up to me one day. And she swore that if I would just give up red wine, I would be able to lose as much weight as I wanted. Because she'd read it in the paper. That's a classic case of false first principles. When I'm in the kitchen, baking, flavour is another area where I'm constantly surprised. Things that I'd factually assigned to one part of my brain, I'm constantly surprised that those were actually assumptions all along. Using fennel in a sweet recipe, licorice in a savoury one. These ingredients that have been relegated to one part of my brain suddenly give a new life. And although it wasn't dangerous that I hadn't realised that before, it meant I was missing out. Is there anything we can do to identify when this is happening? Well, yes. And it's something we use in engineering. It's a principle called five whys. And it basically means questioning your assumptions using the why question down to the point where you start really understanding what your core assumptions or fundamentals are. Let's take the dieting example. I should give up red wine to lose weight. Why? Because I read it in the newspaper. Why was it in the newspaper? Because a journalist wrote it. Why? And that's the interesting question. Three levels in, is there a study to back this up? Or is this to sell papers? Now that might seem like a frivolous example, but actually this way of thinking can really unlock if you've got any hidden assumptions. So what can we conclude from this? First principles thinking can offer real opportunities for innovation and it can really deepen your understanding, but it's not practical to do it all the time. So thinking by analogy is okay, provided you understand your assumptions. 
Over time, your first principles can erode and get shaky. So if you have a collapse, it's a great opportunity to go in and find the flaw in your knowledge. Analogy, if unchecked over time, can turn into fact, which can lead to dogma. So when we have a collapse, what should we do? I think we should embrace it. It's a golden opportunity. Shore up the missing knowledge for next time, or question your basics. And that can be a scary thing to do. It can be easy to let pride get in the way, or throw in the towel. But when you have a mental Jenga collapse, it's your brain care taking itself. It's telling you how you can get your Jenga fighting fit for next time. So if you rebuild carefully, use first principles wisely, I think you could be the next giant we're jumping off the shoulders of.